we're going to get an outsider's view uh, of the payments world from an industry thought leader. And I would like to introduce David Rowan of Wired UK. Now, under David's leadership, Wired won the 2009 launch of the year of the British Society of Magazine Editors Awards. David's knowledge and understanding of trends in the world of consumer behavior, the digital era, social commerce and media has allowed him to become one of the most sought after speakers on the corporate speakers uh, circuit. So we are very lucky to have him today. David, welcome. Buenos dias. Good morning, bonjour, guten tag. I have um, a fairly crazy life. I travel a lot to meet the entrepreneurs trying to build the future, the investors seeing billion dollar opportunities, the research labs like MIT Media Lab where they're trying to create the tools for the future. Um, just to give you an idea, since last Thursday I have been in Iceland and India and the Netherlands and I think this is London. Um, and so what I'm going to do is translate a lot of the trends I'm seeing, a lot of the thinking among the startups in the financial services, particularly payment sector and what they're doing, and try and relate it to, I think, some opportunities for Visa Europe, but also some risks if you don't move quickly enough. Um, so you remember that film, The Graduate, where Mr. Maguire says to Benjamin, I've just got one word for you, Benjamin, one word. Um, it's not going to be plastics now, is it? It's going to be mobile. Everything is going mobile. And the first of the big wake-up calls, I think, is how fundamentally transformative the move to these things is being now. So you remember when the motor car became affordable to middle America in the 1950s? It changed the architecture of America. It changed the physical landscape. This new device meant you could have out-of-town shopping centers. I think we need to think of this as actually much more revolutionary. This is transforming retail and commerce on a bigger scale in a much more compressed time scale. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit about how. Just look at some numbers. So there's still a couple of people, couple of billion people who haven't been online yet, but in the next two years are going to come online for the first time with a version of these. These are falling in price. We're talking about $25 smartphones hitting the market. These are people who are not just your customers. Maybe they're people who will do some of your work for you. Maybe they're people setting up rival businesses the other side of the world who are going to try and take some of your market share. But magical things happen when you connect the world. We're even in a world now where there are apps to tell you how many times a day you're checking your apps because we're getting addicted to this lifestyle. Let me tell you about a man I spent some time with a few months ago. His name is Jan Kuhn. He was a refugee to America from communist Ukraine. He came over at 16, lived on welfare, on food stamps, and got very frustrated that if he wanted to talk to his family in Kiev, it was a really expensive phone call that he couldn't afford. As time went on, he got into tech. He came up with an app, an idea for, keep, for allowing communication at pretty much zero cost. You've probably used this app, and you probably know what happened. Facebook, earlier this year in February, bought WhatsApp for $19 billion. And this is a business that, at that time, had 500 million active monthly users all over the world. And what's really interesting about how WhatsApp gained half a billion customers is how much they spent in its four years of life on a combination of advertising plus marketing plus PR. So we're now in a world where if you design a product that just works, it's a very, very simple product, it will do its own viral marketing. There's a post-it note on that man Jan Coombe's desk by his co-founder Brian Acton. It just says, no ads, no games, no gimmicks. A reminder that when it comes to communicating, 
People want no friction. They just want it to work. And they kept refusing to add features. And I think you have to think of payments in the same way. People don't want technology. They just want that activity to work. Although when WhatsApp was bought, the BBC reported something that helped me understand the valuation, that it was an incredibly valuable massaging service, which kind of explains things. Look at mobile payments. This is just you know, PayPal over the last few years. That is the sort of exponential curve that every business is waking up to and realizing it needs to be there first. It's not the desktop web, it's mobile. Just look at the growth. This is Jack Dorsey's company, Stripe. This is quarter by quarter, just the volume of transactions. Again, nice rising curve. Look at what's happening in places like Kenya, where through peer-to-peer -peer phone transfers, you know, figures about a third of the economy going through these things. Emerging markets are starting to get really interesting. And then um, a new device comes along. This is not the latest bendable, foldable phone. This is the one before that. Um, and there's little technical innovation that suddenly transforms things again. So the iPhone 5 had something in it that Apple called iBeacon, which used low energy Bluetooth, which is a way of the phone connecting with a receiver transmitter 100, 200 meters away. And it means a retailer can communicate with a customer when they're not in the shopping mall. Apple, of course, also has your credit card number. It's got biometric authentication, touch ID. So it makes sense that they would want to be the payments network. They know who you are, where you are. That's definitely you. They've got their credit card details. Fundamental challenge pretty much to every retailer as well as every payment service. So you're already getting companies, this is a startup called Estimote that's using this low energy Bluetooth to connect from the blue box in a retail store, targeting people with special offers because they know who you are, they now know where you are. Lots of these beacon services are being tested, this is PayPal's. So this, this company is pretty interesting, so Uber, is fired up by pressing a button. This is the way we now interact with our world. You want a car, you touch a button. The blue curve is Uber's growth quarter by quarter. The green one is Halo. The red one is Lyft, another American car company. So we're in a world now which is a touch, a push button world. We expect everything. It's happening in food deliveries. These are some American touch on the app, the food will come to you services. It's growing really quickly. So the second of the big things that's happening is it's no longer the authority, the institution that decides what happens. The crowd, once it's connected, does things amazingly by itself. So can anybody guess what these businesses have in common? It's a dating business, a games business. Okay, they all accept Bitcoin. Now these are all Mainstream businesses, they're now accepting cryptocurrencies. And nobody gave them permission to accept cryptocurrencies. Nobody said, we're going to create an officially <coughs> regulated currency. There's even now ATMs linked to the Bitcoin network. But it comes along. And this is just the growth recently of the number of wallets citizens hold with Bitcoin. You can't really ignore that. Something big is happening. And it doesn't mean Bitcoin's necessarily going to be the cryptocurrency that wins. There's a whole bunch of others competing. But what this shows is individuals connected by the network have decided that something isn't working in the current financial establishment. They don't like that friction. They don't like the fees for foreign transactions, the delays before money reaches their account. They see cryptocurrencies as solving some of these problems, and you can't really buck those trends. And then again, once you connect people, interesting other opportunities happen. They don't need to go to the bank to borrow money. Peer networks that will lend to businesses. This is, again, Orchard, another one that's just received a huge amount of funding. One of the bosses of PIMCO has just joined. The big institutions are now realizing this is no longer a little, a little marginal trend. 
peer-to-peer is huge business. In the UK, if you're a business, you can go to a place like Cedars to get seed funding. You no longer have to have that meeting with the bank manager. If you're a stock trader, you can go to eToro, where they make very transparent how effective individuals own trades are. There's a leaderboard of whose share transactions are working the best. If this guy gets 2,000% rise in a year, you can follow his trades. So we're in a world where it took 93 years for Hilton to get 650,000 hotel rooms, but it took four years for these people to get 650,000 hotel rooms. Because the network connects people. I have excess capacity, I have a need. They don't even have to change the hotel sheets. But suddenly value is created really quickly. Which kind of links on to the next trend, which is the moat around established businesses, networks like Visa, it's kind of collapsing. Mark Andreessen invented the first popular web browser and is now one of the most effective, successful investors in Silicon Valley. Um, he's got some very interesting thoughts about payments. He's saying, if we started today, we would not invent any of the financial institutions. The banks are being unbundled. The regulators will, if they stand in the way, other non-bank entities will come along and take that market share. So we're starting to see the unbundling, you know, foreign currency transactions, fast-growing company in London transfer-wise, less than half a percent it will take for that transaction. In Germany, Fedor Bank, which is pitching itself as the members bank, they have chat forums. They recruit maybe 20% of their staff from people active in their community. What about retail? In Q8 now, if you want to buy a sheep, you go to this Instagram page. This is a real phone number. If you want to buy a sheep for your loved one, you can call up now. So commerce, retail, is everywhere. Nobody has given these sheep farmers permission to trade on Instagram, but because that is a platform that everybody can get access to, it works. Michelle Fan sits in her bedroom talking about makeup, making videos on how you can make yourself up for Halloween to look like Angelina Jolie. She's got more than a billion views. She's now launched a makeup range. The makeup companies are having to go to her. She's earning tens of millions of dollars a year. Nobody said, Michelle, you have permission to be a major retailer in the makeup world. So you know Wikipedia. What about WikiHouse? What about architecture? You used to have to train for seven years to be an architect. Now you can go to this site upload plans or modify existing plans and then download them and build a house. So no barriers to entry, they've gone. This guy, a couple of years before Apple had a smartwatch, decided he wanted to make one. His name's Eric Mikikowski. He had this idea for a Pebble smartwatch that would talk to his phone, so he went to Kickstarter. He thought, if I had $100,000, I could do this. 70,000 people loved the idea. $10.3 million comes in. He has a business. These are not experienced manufacturing people in his team, but they got a business going. Who controls the skies? In the old days, the regulators controlled the skies, the Civil Aviation Authority. This is the street riots in Bangkok a few months ago, where the government there imposed a blackout. No media, no photography, except a couple of the activists got a drone and put a camera to it. So they had streaming pictures coming through. Who's in charge now? We're also in a world of data everywhere, and that gets interesting. So what happened online with cookies tracking you is now starting to happen offline. This is a startup called Shopperception that's monitoring in retail stores the behavior of customers to feed back the data on you know, which bits of the shelf are attracting more attention, why this particular customer didn't convert with this item. When you're recruited, increasingly, it's likely that you'll be asked to play a game. This is a game called Wasabi Waiter, designed by a company called Knack. It measures, without you necessarily realizing, during the game, how cooperative you are with colleagues, how good you are at taking decisions under stress, how innovative you are, and it provides a number to the recruiter. 
Monsanto just spent a billion dollars on this company, which tracks weather in detail. Because they realized that if you're a farmer, it can make a big difference to your business. If you've got really accurate forecasts based on massive amounts of data of the various conditions that could affect when you should sow your seeds, when you should harvest your crops. So companies like Wonga, not always very popular, but it redesigned the process of lending around real-time data analytics. Within a fifth of a second as you apply online, their algorithms work out if you're going to be a good bet to lend money to. And they're collecting data on all sorts of things. How long it takes you to answer the question, are you employed? Because they measure after a certain gap, it's more likely to be suspicious. What color car you have? Because that correlates with certain personality traits. And with that data, we're getting closer to that minority report scenario where the shopping mall knows who you are, <laughs> targets you personally. That was science fiction 12 years ago when it was made. It's now kind of a documentary. So again, back to Mark Andreessen and some of the opportunities he sees. The idea that a credit reference agency knows more about you than the data about your real-time transactions, that's no longer the case. You know, PayPal, in fractions of a second, can really understand how likely you are to meet your financial obligations. And so there are companies like Trustev, which has come out of Ireland and is growing in the States very fast, which offers itself as a support to the merchant, who doesn't want to block the trade at the last minute because the merchant is concerned that this could be fraudulent. So Trustev takes data in a fifth of a second, pings your phone to check you are where you say you are, checks your social network automatically to check that your friends are real people, not bots. It's going to be a lot more automation like this. That's how much Trustev says is abandoned in shopping carts because the consumer doesn't want to complete that payment transaction because friction comes in the way. Some other things that are happening that are going to affect how you work, I think, in the next couple of years. Um, artificial intelligence is getting interesting. This is Demis Asabis. He runs a company in London opposite Russell Square Underground Station with about 60 of the smartest PhDs in artificial intelligence. He's trying to teach the machine to think like a person, to confront any challenge that it's given. It's called General Artificial Intelligence. This is his company. Uh, he hasn't released a product, but when I went to see him, he was very excited that they taught the machine how to play Space Invaders. So the first half hour, just using the pixels as the data input, the machine kept getting killed. But like an hour later, it started to recognize patterns, knew when to hide. They left it on all night, and Demis says by the next morning, it was the world's best Space Invader player, never got killed. As I say, they haven't released a product, but it didn't stop Google buying them in January for 400 million pounds. So something big is happening there. Don't know if you've seen the film Her. Got to see it. So I'm not going to tell you how it ends. He falls in love with her. Unfortunately, she has 9,000 other boyfriends on the system. Um, but it's really worth seeing to help understand where artificial intelligence is taking us, because the network is starting to understand us emotionally. It's starting to really be an alternative to a human contact. In 10 years, I think that would be like a reality. Um, so we talk about offline and online. These are redundancies now. They're, everything is connected. I'll explain why through... Tony Fidel's story. He used to work at Apple, led the team that made the iPod, and then Steve got him to lead the team that made the iPhone, the first three generations. Then he left because he got much more excited because he wanted to make a thermostat. So why would Tony Fidel, one of the smartest engineers in the valley, leave the coolest job there? Because he saw a world where sensors are coming down in price. Networking was becoming ubiquitous, and you could reinvent physical devices 
by making them part of what's being called the Internet of Things. So Nest is a smart thermostat that learns your behavior that helps you save energy. This is how much Google bought Nest for in January. There you go. But we're now at a stage where suddenly every manufacturer is thinking, our device that's not connected to the network, oh my god, it's going to be redundant. We need to be connecting. So many of you are probably wearing these kind of smart devices. There's now a whole market for pets, connected devices. You can connect to your phone. Everything that can have a sensor will. This is a basketball that sends a message back to your phone showing how good your shots are. At Wired, we did a project, what happens when the physical streetscape is networked up? So the car, the taxi will get automatic directions from your, your online schedule, or the sandwich shop will know that you're approaching, will prepare your favorite sandwich in advance, or probably more important, the phone will know that your ex-girlfriend or boyfriend is ahead, so you can cross the street in <laughs> good time. We're actually getting to the stage where too many things are being connected to the network. I'm calling this the Internet of Stupid Things. There is a company called Quirky, which allows the crowd to come up with ideas for inventions, and then it votes them up, and then it makes them. Um, Quirky, among other things, has invented the smart jug. They call it the milkmaid for your milk. It's got sensors in. When your milk is starting to go sour, it sends an urgent message to your iPhone, so presumably you have to come home from work early and replenish your milk. It's also done a smart egg carton, but we're not even going to go there. What about toothbrushes? The future of oral care is coming soon. Introducing the new revolutionary Bluetooth-connected toothbrush from Oral-B, developed together with dental professionals, arriving June 2014. With this power brush and app, you and your dental professional can customize your brushing experience and receive personalized guidance to stay on top of your oral care. I don't know about you, I'm not ready for the dentist in the bathroom with me in the morning. This is the internet of stupid things. But it's going to be big. You know, you think about sensors everywhere, tiny, powerful computers. You don't necessarily notice the transactions happening. There are services built in. There is no offline. John Chambers, the boss of Cisco, says this is going to be a $19 trillion business in the next 10 years. He says the internet of physical things is going to be five to ten times as significant as the browser-based in internet that we're used to. So at the same time, the enemy is putting barriers in the way of things just working. And for retailers, it's people abandoning things. Which is why the old rules, this kind of thing, I don't think are going to work. You, know, you don't really want, as a consumer, to have to go through the hoops of remembering that password. Um, I spent some time recently with a startup called Stripe, which many of you may know. It's trying to transform payments into the most seamless service possible. Set up by two brothers, aged 18 and 20, from Ireland, from Limerick, um, it's just been valued at about $1.75 billion. It's powering Apple's Pay, the Facebook Buy button, the Twitter Buy button. They're growing quickly. I was um, interviewing one of the founders, John Collison, on Tuesday at an event in Dublin. He's now 24, so he's an old guy in this business. But just so you understand how he's thinking. So there's like a 20-minute interview I did, which you can catch on YouTube. But I think you have to be really aware of companies like Stripe 
and companies in Sweden like Klarna, which again are trying to simplify that payment process, make it quicker for the consumer to just get what they want. In, in Klarna's case, they carry the risk for the merchant and then they, um, they get a relationship going with the individual customer so that they don't need the customer to give their login details. What about biometric payments? The ATM that recognizes your face. This is a company called Hoyos. So we're going to get a lot more innovation. So think simplifying people's lives. Again, Uber. When you sign up for Uber, you don't need to type in your card number to create an account. You photograph your card. It's one less thing to have to worry about. It scans the details. That's Uber's valuation, by the way, at the last count. You know, do we actually need the remote control? There are companies like Point Switch in Israel that are thinking, Maybe the body should be the way we interact with the network. So there's going to be a lot of experiment in this space. So wearable computing is coming in. It probably won't look like this <laughs> or this. And it won't look like this either, unless you're doing an industrial task. Face it, nobody feels cool walking around with these. Although the tech journalist Robert Scoble, um, when he got his Google Glass, he became obsessed with it. He was wearing it day and night. He said, this is the future. Um, if you don't want to see a grown man in the shower in his Google Glass, look away now. <laughs> um, wearable computing is more likely to be the stuff you'd already wear. This is a company called OmSignal that puts sensors inside clothes, pullovers. They've just done a deal with Ralph Lauren to make clothes for them. Um, the sensors in this jumper will give you this guy's heart rate, how many steps he's made, his breathing rate. It even claims to know his mood. At this moment, this gentleman is excited. <laughs> Again, there's a London company called Ease that's trying to solve the payments problem with Google Glass. It's very simple. You go on the date, you wait for the QR code to be delivered by the waitress, and then you, you nod twice. <laughs> yeah, you're laughing, but he gets the girl. <laughs> um, I don't think this is the future, really because it makes you kind of awkward. But again, it's stuff that you would already be doing as a human being. If you ski, you'd wear goggles. Why not the recon ski visor, which projects data in front of you, how fast you're going, what the weather's like, where you are? What about your personal heartbeat pattern? This is the NIMI, which authenticates you, logs you in, just using your distinctive ECG. Again, it's no trouble wearing a wristband. If this solves that problem, maybe this is one of the futures. And then a new device comes along, like Oculus Rift, which suddenly makes virtual reality actually quite compelling. Changes the rules. Facebook bought them for $2 billion, but people are now experimenting. The Norwegian army is putting Oculus Rift-type goggles on its tank driver's helmets, so they can see extra layers of data. They can know what's around the corner starts to get interesting. So we've got virtual reality, we've got augmented reality, which a couple of years ago was like download a separate app, it was all very unsatisfying. But now we've got these smartphones that know where they are in space. This is a games company in Stockholm called 13th Lab that's using the phone's knowledge of where it is and great visuals to create shootout games in the office. If your colleague has taken your coffee cup, you can get revenge, I don't know, by shooting them. I'm not condoning violence, by the way, just talking about technology. So a couple more things that are happening. Um, this touch <coughs> world is leading people to expect fulfillment right now. They don't want to wait. Amazon is building a supermarket network that delivers same day. Not really because it wants to be a supermarket, but because it's building that infrastructure that can get things back to the customer as soon as possible, same afternoon. eBay is now delivering within one hour in cities like New York. Companies like Postmates will connect you from your mobile device to a nearby store and get things to you within half an hour in some cases. In San Francisco, this company is even claiming to deliver medicines from the pharmacist within an hour by drone. 
So there's a kind of growth area. The founder of Reddit published a book recently, and he realized that time is the thing that people don't have to read books. So he put on the back of it a little logo. This is a five-hour read. This is a New York to San Francisco flight book. Again, it's respecting the fact that nobody has time. When you go to Medium, which is Evan Williams' journalism website, next to each headline, it tells you how long the story will take to read. This is a three-minute story, because nobody here, I think, has too much time. So in a commodified world, service is what makes companies stand apart. And experience is part of service. So in London, Barclays has a design lab with maybe 150 people with titles like this, because they're realizing that to compete, you have to create a better, thorough experience. There's a bank chain that's growing past here that's trying to rethink what a bank should be. It opens on Sunday. It opens in the evening. There are toilets. They will give you dog food if your dog is in there. Think of the Apple genius. Again, they're not trying to sell you something. They're trying to solve the problem. One of the UK's most successful retailers online and offline, its differentiator is service. You know that you're not going to ri get ripped off, and they will try and solve whatever problem arises. So we're getting startups now building a service layer around what they do. There's a London company called Thread, which will help you get clothes, but they'll also put you in touch with a stylist you have an online consultation with. It creates loyalty. You want that unbiased opinion. <laughs> About purchasing things. Getting rid of the friction in purchase, adding the service. This is um, Google Analytics, they're promoting what they're doing. But I think Visa Europe, you have to be aware that too much of our lives is these sorts of experience. Um, the tenth, but probably the most important trend, th trend, I think, is the vulnerability of the network, which has um, never been a greater target for the bad guys. There's a toilet you can buy called the Sartis, which comes with its own app. It's about £4,000. Um, many of you probably own one or aspire to own one. It comes with push-button deodorizing and flushing. Um, there was a security consultant last August that issued a report warning that the Sartis toilet could be hacked. If somebody didn't like you, they could access your toilet remotely to set it flushing or deodorizing all night. <laughs> and I say this not because I think you should leave London with knowledge of the hackable toilet, but because everything is vulnerable in this network. And software like this can be downloaded free, can let anybody access a network. Um, this is now crime as a service. If you go to talk to people who are building botnets to bring systems down, it's because there's money in it. This is the boss of the National Security Agency. It's causing the greatest transfer of wealth in history, he says. This is just the price list on one of these Russian markets. You can hack a Gmail account for $162 or a corporate mailbox for $500. Um, so Visa Europe has been in the news a bit lately. 
I think your chief focus, apart from getting rid of the friction, needs to be absolutely reassuring everybody on the network that you are testing and finding innovative ways to verify security at every stage because there are so many state actors, non-state actors who are trying to get in there. Um, I was talking to a guy called Jake Davis who was one of the team at Anonymous who accessed the MasterCard network among others. I'm just asking him what kind of mindset these people have. So they're not doing it for money. These guys are doing it for the laughs. You know, it's the lols. So just you've got to put every barrier in the way of people like this. I'm going to leave you with a bonus, because everybody likes something free. Um, don't keep still. Don't just look at what official payments companies are doing. Look at the edges. Look at what the startups are doing. Hang around with them. I always think of Stephen Sasson, who in 1975 invented... Who knows what this is? Yeah, it's the first digital camera. Unfortunately, he worked here. That was inconvenient to their business model, so they kind of buried it. So Kodak, which went into bankruptcy two years ago, once had 140,000 staff. At the same time, pa um, Facebook bought this 13-person company for a billion dollars in photography because they realized that what had changed was it wasn't about the pictures, it was about the sharing. Whereas these guys had the same problem as Kodak, but they saw the way the wind was blowing and they realized, actually, maybe we have to work out what the value is inherent in our business and maybe it's not photos, maybe it's imaging science. So they started moving into medical imaging devices, even cosmetics based on light analysis. Fujifilm have done all right. These guys had the chance in 1999 to become a streaming service. They were approached by Enron Broadband Services, but they said, well, no, we're making enough money renting VHS, thank you, we're not interesting. Wrong decision. Streaming is where the market goes. You can't really stop that behavior, because we're in a fast-moving exponential era. The last century was linear, one plus one plus one, eventually you get to 30, but when you're doubling at each step, Moore's law, by the 30th step you get to a billion, and that changes all sorts of rules. So the Moore's law curve continues. Processing means you can get powerful computers the size of an SD card, but it also means you know, storage suddenly becomes free. You can suddenly have a whole industry that appears, Dropbox and Box, that in 1997 or 1994 you couldn't really imagine. And there's an acceleration in the way consumer behavior is changing. It's an exponential curve. So this is how they think in the startups. These are posters on the wall inside Facebook. Get the product out there and see what people want to do with it, but do it quickly. I'm going to leave you with a thought experiment. So it's 1983, you see this new gadget on the market with celebrity endorsers, except you are AT&T, you're the big provider of landlines, copper cables to millions of Americans, okay? So is this a threat or is this an opportunity? So AT&T called in McKinsey and they said, look, tell us how many of these mobile telephones there will be in America by the end of the 20th century. And McKinsey goes and does its number crunching it says, well, we think this could be quite significant. We think there could be about a million of them. Which wasn't a bad guess, but it was slightly out. And there's three things McKinsey got wrong, which I think you need to think about. First, they forgot about Moore's Law. The form factor changes very quickly. It's not necessarily the device that it starts out as. Two, it's not about technology at all. It's about human emotion, about connectivity. This is the device that connects you to your loved ones, simplifies your tasks, allows you to buy things. That's what people want. And three, they were framing their thinking in a 19, 19, in 1983 way, when if you wanted to make a phone call, it was the norm, the social norm to go home, to go to the call box, to go to the office. But the social norm to the next generation is, I want to do what I want wherever I am when I want. You've got to make that bridge. So I'm going to leave you with my own dilemma, because I'm from the traditional publishing world. We produce a lovely, shiny Condé Nast magazine called Wired. And we have an app, obviously. But what happens to the next generation? Because you can't pinch and zoom my magazine pages. <laughs> you can't swipe the cover. Nothing <laughs> happens. So 
So I can't, a serious question though, you know, what will her expectation be in a decade? And we can't continue with how we're doing things now if her expectations are different. Thank you. Hello, hello. <laughs> that was absolutely fascinating. But I, I, I must just take issue with, with one prediction that you made. The guy with the Google glasses, he's so not going to get the girl. I mean, I, I mean, he, you know, the sheep app, maybe. No, but not. Um, a lot of information in there. I mean, I felt watching it, it was like watching that scene in James Bond where 007 goes to see Q, you know. <laughs> so, but what do you think, out of all of that, that the people in this room should be most worried about? Difficult question. Just because you've been working incredibly successfully for the last decades doesn't give you any right to own the market next year. Because there are so many innovative companies that are transforming consumer behavior very, very quickly and fundamentally and creating massive valuations out of nowhere. Um, I think your biggest risk is keeping still because, like Kodak, you had a very, very good business. Mobile is fundamentally restructuring everything. Got that? Thank you very much, David. Thank that you. was extremely useful. <laughs>